Yes, Esther, you want to share something? Yeah, I have an announcement about what we can ask. Okay. You know, a lot of people don't know it here, but uh, Pat can So the facility in Bloomsburg won't allow him to stay there? No, he keeps trying to get out. Yeah, I knew he was trying to escape. Yeah. yeah. He's an escape hmm. Okay. Being with the dementia, I guess, they, that's a special place in Rome. Oh. Uh, okay. Um, now, his son told my husband that, so it must be true. You know, I hate you, Can you write that down for me, like the place, if you know? Yeah, I don't know when he's going to go, because we're going to move. Oh, he's still in Bloomsburg now. Yeah, he was the other day with my husband. Okay. Yeah, if you can give me the info. Appreciate it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, if you'd like to turn with me in the scripture to Isaiah chapter 55. This is a really cool passage from the Word of God that I appreciate. Uh, we're going to continue to study the subject of the principle of first and second. Uh, so kind of let me give you my plan here for the next so many weeks. Um, uh, May, we kind of got uh, totally away from this topic for a couple of reasons and some unexpected things. I was basically gone the first week of May uh, down to the ministry in Georgia, and then Christopher preached for Mother's Day uh, the following week. And then the following week, I gave a uh, message basically dealing with what we learned at the ministry in Georgia about health and healing. So we were off the subject of uh, first and second. And then last week, I was gone, and Brother Mike Winter came and shared with you. All right, so the whole month of May, we've been absent from this topic. Uh, and uh, we had gone, I think we did three messages dealing with this topic uh, before that in April. <coughs> right? And uh, so. Uh, what I typically do, as you know, is during the summer, I kind of like to pick a book of the Bible and kind of study through it from, from beginning to end, right? And I like to get that started in June as soon as possible, just so that I can get through it by the end of the summer um, before we get into, like, late into the fall, right? So uh, as far as I can tell right now, I'm pretty sure I'm going to teach through the book of 2 Corinthians. Right, we did First Corinthians, uh, I think about three years ago, as I recall. I'll check, but uh, everybody remembers that, right? Because <laughs> I don't remember exactly when it was, right? So, yeah, you'll remember what we did last week, right? So, <laughs> yeah, so it was about three years ago we did uh, First Corinthians, so I'd like to teach through Second Corinthians, right? So, uh, that being the case, as you know, we've been working through the principle of First and Second, and uh, I wrote down all the material uh, on that topic that I found through all the Bible, right? So we were kind of working through that. And I had intended to kind of work through all that material into May and be done by pretty much the end of May or the beginning of June. Well, we didn't get there, right? So uh, I think what I'm going to do is um, this morning I'm going to give you a message uh, about the principle of first and second, continuing in the notes where we left off. Uh, and then um, there's actually a second page. You only ever got the first page, front and back. There's actually a second page, another page with front and back, more notes, right? So if we continue with all of it, it would take us another month to get through it. But I think what I'd like to do is kind of push pause on that because I want to get into Second Corinthians. So uh, I'm just going to let that second page go. Um, and what I'd like to do is next week, kind of fast forward to the end, uh, sort of the practical application of all of it, what we've been look, looking at about the principle of first and second, right? So we're going to go to the last page. I'm going to give you a, you know, what I consider the summary of what I consider the main important points of the whole idea of the principle of first and second. So we're going to do that next week, get all the practical application involved with uh, all, the, all the stuff that we've looked at and some of the stuff that we didn't look at, but we're just going to kind of fast forward and uh, look at that and then maybe come back to that second page that I'm skipping 
maybe later on sometime, maybe in the fall or whenever it fits in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sort of, kind of, right? Sure. All right, so, so this week we're going to do continue with the notes. Next week I'm going to do a summary. And then the following week is Father's Day. So I think what I'd like to do with Father's Day is have a special message about fathers. Uh, probably uh, similar to what Dr. Henry Wright teaches in his ministry about fathers' love. Right? So we'll probably take a look at that topic on Father's Day because it's such a critically important truth for us to understand. So I kind of want to do that for Father's Day. And then the last Sunday of June is when I want to start in the Second Corinthians. Okay? So that's the plan. That's the plan. That's good of a plan I can come up with. All right. So that being said, um, let's jump in then to the scripture reading. Uh, Isaiah chapter 55. We're going to read verses 6 through 11. <clears throat> Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. To our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return to <coughs> without watering the earth, and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. I really love this passage and how it uh, really exalts the word of God uh, to us. Right? The fact that the word goes out from God's mouth, and he says it will not return to me empty, but accomplish all that I desire. And so with this particular study, about the study of first and second, this is a little bit different than what I typically do, right? You've noticed the difference. A little bit more picayune, kind of a, or, that's a kind of <laughs> weird word, right? But, you know, kind of getting into, really digging into like little what would be seemingly insignificant details in the Word of God. But partly what I want you to see is that every single word of Scripture is significant, right? There are no such thing as insignificant details in the Word of God. Every word, every letter is there by God's design to teach us something. And so as we've been looking at the principle of first and second, I'm looking at like fussy little details in the Scripture uh, because they're important, right? So it's a little bit deeper than I normally go, and uh, I hope I'm not confusing anybody or, or boring you to death or anything like that. Uh, but I think sometimes it's good to kind of just dig in and see the fabulous intricacy of the Word of God. I like the scripture up above there, like in verses, uh, verses 8 and 9, right? My thoughts are not your thoughts, okay? Who has deeper and smarter thoughts? Us or God? Right? I mean, he knows a lot more than us, right? To the point where we could be in heaven for a gazillion years, studying every day, every day, every day. Right? And we don't even come close to even having one tiny little smidge of the amount of wisdom and knowledge and greatness that God does. You see, he's always far above us. Right? He says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And that truth is communicated to us in the Word of God. Right? God gives us His Word and the intricacies of the details so that we might begin to understand just how awesome He is. And so the whole point of what I'm trying to get to with the principle of first and second is this idea of to live the second life. Right? We don't live the first life that's not what we focus on. That's where we start. That's our physical life, our earthly life. We start there. But the whole point of why God created us is to live the second life. Right? And I, I like the way the first couple verses uh, kind of draw us to act out in life what we're learning in the Word of God. 
Okay, so it says there in verses 6 and 7, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Okay, right now, God can be found. To every human being on the planet, God makes himself available. He has given us his word, the truth of the word of God. God is not trying to hide from us. He's not trying to be elusive. God wants to be found. But what do we need to do? What's the first word say? Seek the Lord. See, we have to seek the Lord. He can be found, but we have to seek him. That's what the second life is about. We live the second life is the life of seeking the Lord to grow deeper, to understand him more, to grow in a relationship with him. It says, call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And that's the way of the first life. That's the earthly life. And the evil man is thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. To our God, and he will freely pardon. You see, God wants to be found. But we find him when we live the second life. Okay, so in our notes, we covered the whole first half of the page. And on the back side, we got onto the back side of the page. And we got through the, uh, this part of our notes up here where it talks about the first man to walk with God, Enoch, and the second man to walk with God, Noah. And we talked about that and looked into God's plan for the ages. So we're going to pick it up uh, this morning with the sons of Noah, right? And see where we are in the notes, if you have your notes still. Okay, uh, and the sons of Noah are Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But what, again, when we look into the details of the Word of God, we see that even though it's listed this way in many scriptures, if you look at the left column, right, we see the first son of Noah is Japheth, the third son of Noah is Ham, I'll get to Shem in a minute, right, and uh, what you see in the scriptures in the left column towards the bottom of that little section there is where I have in the notes, Shem, Ham, and Japheth is not birth order. Right? Now, if you look at Genesis 5, 32, Genesis chapter 6, verse 10, Genesis chapter 9, verse 18, Genesis 10 and verse 1, we're not going to look at all those. But if you were, it's listed this way. The sons of Noah were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So you would naturally think, okay, Shem's the oldest, right? Ham's the second, and Japheth is the last. Shem, Ham, and Japheth, because that's how they're listed in the in a lot of places in that passage in Genesis. But again, when you get to the details, you discover that Japheth is the oldest, and Shem is the second son of Noah, and Ham is the third son of Noah. Right? And again, according to the principle of first and second, the first son represents the earthly things, the second son always represents the spiritual things. And we see that is true with uh, Shem. Right, so if you go to Genesis chapter 9, right, and um, Genesis chapter 9, let's get there. Okay, Genesis chapter 9 and verse uh, let's see, verse 18. Okay, again, this is where it's listed in that order. The sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay, they're listed in that order, not a birth order. Okay, let me show you this. Go now to chapter 9 and verse 24. And it says, uh, when Noah awoke from his wine, okay, so Noah got drunk, back story there. <laughs> Climbed in the vineyard after they got out of the ark, got drunk, and uh, was naked. And uh, the story right above that in verse 22, Noah's laying in his tent and uh, naked, and Ham wanders in and sees his father naked. Okay, so Ham, being the third son of Noah, goes in and sees his father naked. Apparently it wasn't a very good thing. Remember, in the beginning, in creation, <coughs> Adam and Eve were naked just before the fall, and they felt no shame. But then after they fell, then all of a sudden, that changed everything, right? And God had to make them coverings to cover their nakedness. So something was spoiled in creation, and so nakedness kind of represents 
something that went wrong with the fall of man. Uh, but when you get to verse 24 then, you'll notice, when Noah awoke from his wine and found what his youngest son had done to him, his youngest son, notice, you see, and that he's talking about again from verse 22, we know that who he's talking about is Ham. Right? So Ham was the youngest son of Noah out of the three. Now go to chapter 10 and verse 21. Okay? And again, we see Shem, Ham, and Japheth in many places. But in these two scriptures, we find out the birth order. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 21. Sons were also born to Shem, whose older brother was Japheth. Okay? Whose older brother was Japheth. So Japheth was older than Shem, and Ham was the youngest. So you see the birth order now. The birth order is Japheth is the oldest, Shem is the second son of Noah, and then Ham is the third son of Noah. Now there's a lot of other scriptures we can look at in that regard, uh, but we're not going to get into that because I kind of want to get through as much of this as possible. So the important point that I want you to see is the fact that uh, Shem is the second son of Noah, which represents the spiritual line from Adam, who is going to eventually lead to Christ. Okay, uh, in chapter 11, right, uh, you see the kind of the genealogy of Shem. Uh, Genesis chapter 11, verse 10, starts out that genealogy. It says, this is the account of Shem, two years after the flood, when Shem was 100 years old, he became the father of Arphaxad, if I'm saying that correctly. And then it goes down a whole big long genealogy until you get through chapter 11 and uh, eventually leading to Abram, who we know was the father of the nation of Israel. Uh, and then through that line, eventually led to Christ being born. So we see Shem was the godly line that led to Christ. Shem was the second son of Noah, Again, so you see the consistency of the idea of the principle of first and second. You see it? Okay, the second things in Scripture very often point to, the, to what is more significant spiritually. Okay, so, uh, so I'm going to leave that topic there. Right, I want to skip down to the next thing. Right, in your notes, uh, let's look at the two arcs. The first arc and the second arc that are listed in scripture. I think this is pretty interesting. The first ark is the ark of Noah, uh, and where we see God's earthly provision saving physical life. Okay, so go back to Genesis chapter six. Okay, and I wanna read verses 11 through 22. And again, notice the emphasis on the earthly context of Noah's ark. Right, and then we're going to look at the second arc representing spiritual things. But you see, it's all about saving uh, people on the earth, saving physical life on the earth, is the first arc, the arc of Noah. Genesis 6, starting in verse 11, we see the earth was in a bad condition. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. Anything different today? Mm -hmm. kind of, we're kind of back to that same point, which is kind of scary, isn't it? Right? You know, it was like, is judgment coming? Kind of to the epic scale, like Noah's flood? Yeah. We're going to find out, right? The earth was corrupt and God's sight was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all people on the earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Okay, here's an ark of wood. Right, so just make note of that. Make rooms in it and, a, and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build the ark. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. That's big. If you want to see what it looks like, go to Northern Kentucky and Ken Ham built one, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, they have a full scale ark replica there. That's really, really cool. In fact, DJ and Cindy were just there, right? How cool was the ark? Way cool. Way cool, okay. There you go, there's your advertisement. Go see the ark, <laughs> all right? 
Okay, so uh, I'll continue with verse 16. It says, make a roof for it and finish the ark within 18 inches of the top and then put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper deck. So when you go to the ark in northern Kentucky, there's one door, okay? Take a guess what that one door in the ark to save humanity represents spiritually. One door into the ark that's going to save humanity. What does that door represent? Jesus. Jesus Christ, right? And his provision for us to purchase salvation for us through dying on the cross of Calvary. One door into the ark, one doorway to heaven through Jesus Christ, right? So you see the symbolic nature of that. Very, very important. So he continues, I am going to bring a flood, flood waters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, every kind of animal, every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. And Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. So we see, obviously, the purpose of the Ark of Noah was God's provision to save physical life through Noah's family and then all the animals on the Ark. Okay? So now let's look at the spiritual Ark. Okay? Principle of first and second. First things, earthly things. Second things, spiritual things. The second Ark mentioned in Scripture is the Ark of God's heavenly presence providing spiritual life. First Ark's about physical life. Second Ark is about spiritual life. Go to the book of Exodus, and uh, the scripture I have noted in your notes is Exodus 25. Uh, but let me just read a couple verses from Exodus chapter 24 first. And I want you to see the spiritual nature of God's presence and how this is far superior than just us getting on a boat to save our physical lives. The more important thing is for us to experience spiritual life with God. And this is what the second ark represents. Exodus 24, starting verse 15, says, When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. Okay, so not just in a boat, now we're experiencing the glory of the Lord. It says, For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud, and he went up to the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain forty days and forty nights. Okay, so God's presence is the context of this passage. Okay, now let's look at the second ark. Exodus chapter 25, beginning verse 10, says, How do I make a chest of acacia wood? Okay, and it's going to call it an ark here in just a couple seconds when we get a little bit further in the passage. Right? Here it's called a, a chest of acacia wood. Notice how it's given the measurements. Isn't it interesting? Two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Now just kind of get a picture in your mind. Okay, so it's long, and about that wide, and about that high. Okay, remember the ark? What was approximately the configuration of the ark. It was long, right, and proportionally. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Two wooden boxes. One is super huge to save physical life. And one's just a little box, little wooden box, you know, two and a half cubits long, cubit and a half wide, cubit and a half high, just a little wooden box. Isn't that neat? But this is the box for God's presence. So he continues to describe it, verse 11. Overlay with pure gold, both inside and out, and make a gold molding around it. Cast four gold rings for it and fasten them to its four feet, with two rings for one side and two rings for the other. Then make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the side of the chest to carry it. The poles are to remain in the rings of this ark. Right? So there you see the word ark. 
the second ark. They are not to be removed. Then put the ark, uh, put in the ark the testimony which I will give you. And we know that's the Ten Commandments, the stone tablets. Make an atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. Make two cherubim out of the hammered gold at the ends of the cover. Make one cherub on one end and the second cherub on the other. Make the cherub of one piece with the cover at the two ends. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim are to face each other, looking toward the cover. Place the cover on top of the ark and put in the ark the testimony which I will give you. And then notice carefully here what this ark is all about, verse 22. There above the cover, between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony, I will meet with you and give you all my commandments for the Israelites. You notice how much God, like how much he knocks this up in terms of the importance. In the first ark, it was a big wooden boat. You get on the boat and you're going to save your physical life. But then when we look at the second ark, much smaller, but far more important. Why? Because God's very presence was with that second ark. And the importance of that is, God doesn't want us just to live the first life, the earthly life, our physical existence. What is the whole purpose of life? To meet with God to enjoy his presence. That's what the second ark represents. He says, between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony, I will meet with you. When we live the second life as God desires, <clears throat> that's where we meet with God. We live in his presence when we live the second life. So you see the picture there once again. Okay, the next thing you notice, I'm just going to skip completely because I want to get to the rest of this and I want to finish with the important note there for today. Okay, so maybe we'll come back to this a different time about the first blessing of multiplication of people and the second blessing of multiplication of people, which included a spiritual covenant for Noah and his sons. Okay, in the first one, uh, after that covenant was spoiled by the sin of Adam and Eve, there was a flaming sword of judgment. The second blessing of multiplication of people, which included that covenant for Noah and his sons. At the end, there was a shining rainbow promise. Okay, if you have a choice between those two, which one would you pick? Flaming sword of judgment, shining rainbow promise. Which one do you want? The rainbow. Really? Nobody wants a flaming sword of judgment? Sounds pretty bad, right? Okay. So again, I'm just going to skip that one. You can go back and study that one. Okay, let's go to Abraham and Sarah's first son. And Abraham and Sarah's second son. Right? So again, the principle of first and second. First things represent things of the earth. Second things represent the heavenly purposes of God. Right? We see that these two sons, first born Ishmael and the second born Isaac. Okay, Ishmael was the son of the slave woman Hagar, and we read about that in Genesis chapter 16, but that's the story, but we're not going to take time to do that. Uh, but that gives the background, right, so you can go back and look at that later, okay, in, within the context of the idea of the principle of first and second. So I want to go to Galatians chapter 4, it's there on your notes on the left side, and we want to take a look at what Hagar and... Uh, Sarah represent and what Ishmael and Isaac represent. Okay, so Galatians chapter 4, right, it says very specifically they represent something. They did have their own lives, that's true, they were real people, but they're a picture of a principle to teach us something. Okay, Galatians 4, we're going to start in verse 21. <clears throat> Tell me you will want to be under the law. The whole book of Galatians is Paul talking about the fact that the law was an Old Testament principle that was followed by the nation of Israel. But now in the New Testament, we're following a better way, a spiritual way of connecting to God. 
Okay, so he was correcting the people that wanted to go back to the law. Okay, so verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman, which one was first? That one, right? One by the slave woman, and the other by the free woman. That's the second son. Verse 23. The son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way. Right? He represented the earthly way. But his son by the free woman was born as a result of a promise. So God had a special spiritual significance to the second son of Abraham and Sarah. Now, verse 24 says this very specifically, saying they're a spiritual picture. Look at verse 24, right? After what I just read, it says, these things may be taken figuratively, right? They were real people, but they are a spiritual picture of a principle for every human being, okay? We can live the first life and be children of a slave woman spiritually speaking, or we can live the second life and be children of the free woman and experience the freedom of God through Christ. You see the first and the second, right? So they're a picture. These things, verse 24 says, may be taken figuratively, for the women represent two covenants. The first covenant, the covenant which dominated the things of the earth. The second covenant is the new covenant which came to us through Christ to allow us to experience a spiritual relationship with God, where God himself actually comes to dwell within us. You see the difference in the superiority of the second thing, okay, between the two covenants, between the two covenants. These two women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar, right? Verse 25 says, Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, O barren woman, who bears no children. Break forth and cry aloud, you who have no labor pains. Because more are the children of the desolate woman who started out desolate, than of her who has a husband. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born in the ordinary way, that's the first one, Ishmael, okay, persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit, that's Isaac. So you see the difference between the earthly things, Isaac representing the son born in the power of the spirit. Okay, earthly things, spiritual things. He says at the end of verse 29, it is the same now. But what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance of the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Now, you should be able to answer this question pretty obviously, right? Which would you rather be? Sons of the slave woman or sons of the free woman? Do you want to live as slaves or do you want to live as free people? Okay. The choice is pretty obvious. Do you know where we find that freedom? In Christ when we live the second life in Christ. Not the first life, the earthly life. The earthly life is represented by the slave people. The spiritual life is represented by the people born in the power of the Spirit to experience the freedom that we only have in Christ. Very important. Now for the practical application of this, let's just go one chapter over in Galatians chapter 5 and you see the significance of how very important it is for us to live the second life. Okay, Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 13, says, You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. See, the point is, there is a plague in modern Christianity. 
You know what it is? Instead of people making the commitment and putting and seeking the Lord first and putting their effort into pursuing God to live the second life, they want a little bit of both. You know, yeah, I want Jesus because I want to get that hell free card. Like, I don't want to burn in hell for eternity. So, okay, I'll take Jesus. But, you know, I don't really want to live the second life. I don't like that holiness stuff. I don't like forsaking sin. I want to enjoy all the pleasures of this earth, and then I want to land in heaven when I get done. Guess what? It doesn't work that way. You have a choice. It's one or the other. First life or second life. That's our choices. You can't live first and a half. I'll come back to that next week, okay? You can't be first and a half. You can't have all the stuff of this earth and then get all the blessings of God. You have to choose one or the other. Paul makes a very stark contrast between the first life and the second life here in this passage. I'll continue reading, you'll get the point. Okay, verse 14, Galatians 5. <clears throat> the entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit. That's the second life. And you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. That's the first life. But the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the spirit of what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other. They don't go together. You can't call yourself a Christian and pursue the sinful nature. It just doesn't work that way. It says they are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Right? That's the second life. If people want to continue in the first life, Look what the end result is. Verse 19. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. This is all first life stuff. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. You could also call that sorcery. It's a Greek word, pharmakia. Okay, we talked about that once before, remember? Okay, what else goes with the sinful nature? Hatred, discord, jealousy, Fits of rage. Anybody having fun yet? Okay, that's describing television right there. Everybody say amen. amen. Come on. Amen. amen. All right. <laughs> Selfish ambition. Sounds like a politician. Dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. In other words, Paul says, I can make a longer list if you want it. If you're not sure, Tune into Hollywood. They'll give you a full <laughs> menu. Paul says, I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this, live for the first life, the earthly life, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. For all those people who think they got to get out of hell free card, Oh, I ask Jesus into my heart. And then they go on living like the devil. Living for the sinful nature. Guess what? Those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Are we missing anything there? Who wants to live that life? Not me. I don't think you do either. Which life does God want us to live? How about the second life? Let's read about what happens, what we enjoy in life when we live the second life, forsaking the first life, killing it, letting it go into the past. Now my life is about a totally new thing in Christ. Here's a description of it. But the fruit of the Spirit the second life, the fruit of the Spirit are these things. Love, joy, peace. Is this sounding better than the first list? Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, 
gentleness, and self-control. Oh, pairs of thought. You mean I can only have two beers at the Silver Bullet? <laughs> yes, self-control. <laughs> okay, I'm just having some fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature. You realize you can't be half crucified? If you get crucified, you're dead. Okay? Some people want to, you know, I just want to get 10% crucified. You know, I want to give 10% of my life to Jesus, but 90% I want to live for myself. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. You want to live a second life, you've got to be fully crucified. The old life has to die on that cross to be crucified with Christ so that the Christ life can come through so that you can live the second life. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Every single one of them. Since we live by the Spirit, second life, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Okay? We get the point, right? God calls us to live the second life. Okay? So I just want to cover this next little set there and we'll finish with the important note and then we'll be done. Okay? Okay, we see the example with Ishmael and Isaac, the two sons of Abraham and Sarah. We see it again. You think God's trying to give us a principle, first and second? Isaac and Rebekah's first son is Esau. Isaac and Rebekah's second son, Jacob. Who is the son of promise? Who is the son that led up to Jesus Christ? It was Jacob. Okay? Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 16 and 17. We see the mention there. Hebrews 12, 16 and 17. See to it that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau. Esau lived the first life. Who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could not, he could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. So you see, Esau represents the first life. Now go to Romans chapter 9. I want you to see uh, this very Interesting passage that has caused a lot of argumentation in the theology world. But I'm going to give you my interpretation, okay? All right, Romans chapter 9, verses 10 to 13. <clears throat> Again, looking at the spiritual picture we see with these two sons, Esau and Jacob, Jacob being the second son. Verse 10, Romans chapter 9. Not only that, but Rebecca's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born, or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose and election might stand. Okay, so take note of these words. God's purpose. God's purpose. Right? So God had a special purpose for the principle of first and second. Which is why he had a special purpose for Esau and Jacob. And why, why he kept that principle in Scripture. They're a picture for us, showing us that we are to live the second life. Okay? So that in order that God's purpose and election might stand, verse 12, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Okay? First will serve the second. Just as is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. Wow! God! How could you hate somebody like that? This drives theologians nuts. Hmm. You want to know my interpretation? And how I understand this passage? To me, it's all about the principle of first and second. Does God love all people? Of course he does. But what did Esau choose for himself. We read it just there, right? He chose to live a godless life. 
He chose to live the first life. God loved him, would have chosen, would have wanted him to come into fellowship with himself, but he didn't. Jacob lived a different kind of life, right? He became the son of promise, which is why it says, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. So just like when we look at uh, Abraham and Sarah's children, and about Hagar representing the slave women, and Sarah representing uh, being the mother of the free, uh, of people that are free, right? This is a spiritual picture. Esau is a spiritual picture of people who live the first life. Jacob is a spiritual picture of people who live the second life. So my way of interpreting this, when I read these words in scripture, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated, right? Here's my way of understanding that. And this is just kind of my guess, okay? My way of understanding what this is all about. I look at it this way. God loves all people, desires them to fellowship with himself. But we live in freedom, so we have a choice. With that choice, we can choose to continue to live the first life, and then ultimately experience destruction, or we can choose to live the second life and experience redemption and freedom and deliverance from sin and the gift of eternal life. What does God hate? Does God hate people? I say no. God hates the thought of people living the first life and then experiencing eternal damnation. God hates the thought of that. That's what Esau represents. God is grieved when people with their freedom choose to live for sin instead of being redeemed to experience life in Christ. To me, that's what Esau and Jacob represent. But I want to make sure that you're not misinterpreting this in a different way. And I, uh, when I did this up on the mountain in West Virginia, I was talking to Alex and Christopher. Who's my firstborn? Alex. Alex. Who's my secondborn? Christopher. Christopher. Okay. Now some people might uh, misinterpret what I'm trying to say is, Alex <laughs> represents the simple things, <laughs> and Christopher represents the better things that are spiritual, right? Because he's my second point son. <laughs> Wrong message. That's not the point here. Okay? So the important note in your scripture, or in your notes here, right? Please make sure you don't misunderstand this. Because if you're the firstborn, you're going to start thinking like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble, I'm the firstborn. <laughs> Remember, those examples I just gave you are spiritual pictures of, our, of every person's life. Right? We all can choose to live the first life or the second life. God hates the idea of the first life because it ends in destruction. He loves the second life because it ends in eternal life with Him. Right? It's a spiritual picture. Don't interpret that to mean something against you if you're the firstborn of your family. Okay? These examples of the firstborn representing the earthly things and the secondborn representing heavenly things are for the special purposes of God, like I read about there in Galatians. These examples and principles do not apply to the birth order of the rest of humanity as a rule. They are a symbolic picture of a spiritual truth about every person, whether firstborn or secondborn. Okay? Firstborn children are loved by God, secondborn children are loved by God. The thing that God does not love is when people choose to live the first life instead of the second life. Okay? So we all got that important note? Okay. I'm done. It's not even new. <laughs> Yay! Okay? So that's where I'm going to stop in the notes. And I said, I'm going to give you, uh, next week I'm going to give you the second page in your notes. Okay, to go along with this one. And then I'm going to summarize everything we talked about and emphasize the practical application. That's next week. And then the following week I'm going to do uh, a special thing about Father's Day. Okay? Any questions? Comments? You're all looking kind of sleepy like that. <laughs> oh, man, you're killing us.
<clears throat> Have you enjoyed this? Have you learned something through this? Absolutely. Yes. Oh, okay, yes. Good. Good. Let me pray. Let me do that. <laughs> Father in heaven, we thank you this morning for the Word of God and the beauty of the Word of God. Father, we marvel at the intricate detail, details that you have put in the Word of God that with a casual reading, Father, we could maybe look at some things as being insignificant details. But what we've been learning with the principle of first and second is the fact that there are no insignificant details. Every single word and letter of Scripture has a meaning because of the depth of your wisdom and character they have shown from the very beginning of creation, and you will continue to show to the very end of time and on into eternity. Father, we thank you for this amazing picture of the principle of first and second in Scripture, how the first things represent the things of this earth. And Father, we thank you for that gift of life, uh, for us to have a, a life on the earth. It's a wonderful gift. But the ultimate purpose of that first life is for that first life to be given over to you in faith so that we might live the second life of redemption through Christ. Father, I pray that each and every one of us had made that decision to give our first life to you so that we might experience the very best of second life with you, that spiritual life where we meet with you, where we walk with you, where we experience the very best of the fruit of the Spirit, things like love and joy and peace. Father, help us to just spread this message to those around us. We, when we look at the condition of our country, Father, we see that there are many people living the first life. And many people who call themselves Christians trying to live a little bit of the first life and a little bit of the second life. Father, I pray that we would escape that apostasy and be people who are all about the second life, that we enter into it as if we were crucified with Christ so that Christ might live within us in the second life in every single way. Father, do that good work within us. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, I think we're going to sing a hymn. 336. 336.